allihop och välkommen tillbaka till en ett avsnitt av Between Lines podden som är avspelare och förspelare med mig, Elias Desport. Idag har vi en väldigt speciell gäst, någon som är en familjevän till mig och hela familjen Desport. Och det här avsnittet kommer faktiskt vara på engelska så without further ado så vill jag presentera my next guest, Andrew Plake. How's it going man? Good to be here. Finally, glad to finally be on, man. This is long overdue. We've been <laughs> we've been trying to get this scheduled for for quite some time. So so uh, honored to be on the podcast. Um, extremely excited. Can't wait to can't wait to um, dive into it with you. Hey, no doubt, man. Like you said, um, this has been long overdue. Um, I feel like we've been playing phone tag damn near the whole summer and half the spring to get this done. But um, yeah, I'm super excited to finally get this done, man. It's gonna be it's gonna be a lot of fun. All right, so let's not waste any more time. Let's get into it. Um, let's start off with some icebreakers to get us started. Um, so my first question to you is: the best Swedish player you play with or against? Um, you know, it's at different stages in my life, but overall, I mean, it'd, it'd be hard not to not to um, agree on that. Jonas Jurevko was the best player that I played with and against. Uh, but growing up. Um, when I moved to Sweden, it was without a doubt William Copeland. William was a beast <laughs> as a as a teenager playing. He was an absolute nightmare to play against. Um, so so battling with him was always a pleasure. Um, I don't know how many endless nights I just w- would be up, like thinking of how am I going to handle his quickness, his speed, change of direction. Um, but then but then you know obviously playing against with Jonas uh, being our all time best Swedish player like. Uh, it was phenomenal to see his development. I got a chance to play with him on the national team when he was really young, and I remember calling home and and to my dad and just being like, "Man, this kid is special. Like he's he's uh, you can already see it. Like you know, he was so raw at that time, but you could just see the skill, the 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 mental strength that he had, the physicality, athleticism. So so, yeah, he he's special. Mm, yeah, hear that. Next question. Who was the your favorite basketball player growing up? Like, who did you used to watch uh, when you were a kid? Well, since I grew up in LA, it'd be it'd be hard to 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 not say Magic Johnson. I mean he he was the person that put a smile on everybody's face. Um, he was the person that the game that I wanted to, to emulate. Um, also, also Pistol Pete Maravich was a, was a a big role model for me. The way he would you know he was a magician out there as well. So those two were were just players that I remember just watching them handle the, how they handled the ball, how they how they carried themselves, the joy they brought to their to their audience, the entertainers they were. Um, so so Pistol and Magic were unbelievable influential in, in my development. Yeah. So about Magic too, I wanted to ask you: Did you happen to play against him in the Swedish league when he was here, or were you somewhere else at the time? No, no, I had. I had I had gone back. Uh, I was in college, I believe, then. Um, so I was not in Sweden at the time. Um, you know, it was it was surreal to hear that he was in Sweden. Um, I did get a chance to meet him. He he, both me and Copeland were down in Gothenburg. He had some he had some camp down there for like some you know select players they brought in and and we got to to work out with him. But that was like mid 90s i believe it was uh, but i was not in sweden when he when he played no um i'm glad i'm glad personally that i wasn't here for that i mean you know the memories that i have of him playing in a lakers jersey uh obviously he came here and, and was a showman in itself but but the memories that i have uh, um he was a probably far greater player then so so i'm better i'm glad i didn't see that up up close when he was in sweden at that time of his career um even if it was mind-boggling for, for our Swedish fans. But, you know, growing up during Showtime, I mean, there's, there's uh, in my opinion, and I might be a little biased, <laughs> there's no better basketball than than the late 80s Lakers, you know. It's just uh, they, were, they, they, were, they were the place to be and, and the team to watch. So, um, and I don't care what any Bulls fans say. I don't care what any Celtics fans say, you know, purple and gold right. all the way, baby. Right. <laughs> uh, man, yeah, I hear that. All right, next question. Uh, California summers or Swedish summers? 
Oh man, you put me in a tough one, but that's that's not even close. And and I I'm sorry to say this, but California summers with the sunset, surfing surfing till the sun goes down, waking up getting donuts, you know, getting a little workout in, run the beach. Um, getting donuts, <laughs> man. If, if you haven't had a California donut, then we shouldn't even be having this podcast. California donuts are unbeatable. Um, you know, um, I, I will say this though. Swedish summer is unbelievable when when the when the weather is nice. I know we were in the states this summer calling home. I heard that the, the weather wasn't too great here, but you know, San Diego guaranteed twenty five degrees, sun all day, perfect weather, nice little breeze. You know that that salt that salt water, fresh air. You know you, you can't beat that. You can't beat that. No mosquitoes. You got we got no no mosquitoes. Right, right. Mm. <laughs> no, you're right. I even, it's funny you mentioning because, you know, mosquitoes up north, especially there, it's tough to deal with, man. You can't it even enjoy, like, I can't even be outdoors right now. The mosquitoes are everywhere. It's like, yeah, let's go out. And then all of a sudden you just start getting frustrated. And like, yeah. So, sorry, but California all day. All right. So, last question. Favorite basketball sneaker that you played in? Oh, um, I will have to say probably the ones that stood out for me the most. And I think that uh, people that were my age will remember that, that when I was my rookie year, I wore the Nike foam posits. And I think I was at the time, the only one in Sweden, the only one in Sweden that had them. Um, I had, I had got, I had got them at the Nike camp and I brought them to Sweden and uh, wore them the blue ones. And uh, they were probably the shoe that I remember the most. Um, there are, there are some shoes that bring back memories. I mean, like the, the Nike Hirachis, uh, when they first came out, I was like 16, 17, uh, a few Jordans, you know, the patent leather Jordans obviously were, were huge shoe to remember. So it, I'd say this the patent leather Jordans and, and, uh, the foam posits were probably my two best, two best sneakers. The foam posits are more like street sneakers nowadays though. Like you don't really see people playing in them no more. Like those people, you should wear the phone posits to walk around in like your everyday sneaker. Yeah, you know the thing was the thing was in man when when they came out though Penny was so man he was a bad dude man and and the way he played like his game was just so smooth. Obviously now that you know a lot of the, the you know the phone posits and a lot of the Jordan sneakers they've obviously become street street kicks or or shoes you see outdoors. But I mean um, when when Penny was rocking them. Man, who who didn't want to who didn't want to play like him? You know what I mean, so obviously, like um, you know, and then because uh, that was year also like Bibby and them wore them in the uh, tournament when they won it. So they got they got the shoes before they came out, and then uh, there was just so much success wrapped around that shoe. So when I got it, and it was so unique, and you know, now shoes are so uh, extraordinary with all the coloring and all the different colorways but then everything was so simple it was like white black a little red a little blue here but when the phobosis came out with that you know that chic look and and you know shiny blue royal blue they really stood out and it was like wow man these are these are pretty cool you know so those are good memory all right so moving on let's talk a bit about your background obviously you're a, a cali kid born in out there in California, yeah. uh, moved to Sweden in the early '90s. You have a an American father and a Swedish mom, just like myself, with a dual citizenship. Correct. Um, so, talk a bit about your upbringing. Obviously, growing up in, in California, but also um, growing up in, in Sweden. How was that? Yeah. So, so born in LA, um, grew. Yeah, born born and raised in LA. Um, played three sports growing up. Basketball was not my favorite sport. I was probably more of a, a baseball junkie growing up. Uh, then we moved to Sweden. I was around, you know, 11 or so. Uh, and the reason we moved, my sister had just, had just um, got through cancer. She had, she had her kidney removed. She was three at the time. Family needed, needed just a change, needed something new. Uh, family was stressed out. Um, so, so my grandpa at the time lived in Vesteros. He had fixed a job for my mom. Uh, we moved to Vesteros, um, and then um, shortly upon then, my dad started working for the club, coaching you know every team that they had, helping out as much as they could, um, and and just kind of was such a shock and a change from to go to <laughs> Dakota from you know growing up in Southern California, where you could never play outdoors because 
you know, we grew up in a, not a bad area, but definitely tough, tougher. And then coming to Sweden where it was like freedom, you could ride your bike anywhere, be anywhere. I remember just that freedom just being like, wow, like this is a pretty cool childhood. But then shortly upon that, the, that my first Swedish winter hit me hard, you know, the dark nights with the snow. And, and uh, I remember at that point being like, what are we doing here? Like just questioning, like the decision to move of being like, you know, 11, 12 year old kid being like, man, just get me back home. But, um, and obviously I couldn't play baseball. Baseball wasn't that big. I had to play with like 20 year old kids that, you know, obviously threw harder and, and, uh, just, so, so I started playing a lot of tennis, a lot of basketball, um, and then a lot of soccer, like soccer and basketball, probably my two numbers, number one sports. Um, and then I just kept getting better at basketball. I just like kept getting stronger, bigger, better, um, st- played with a, an age group that was above me one year older than me and excelled. And just, you know, in that, in that success felt more and more comfortable and more and more joy with it. And, and we kind of turned Vestoros Basket into a powerhouse. Um, we took that team that were born in 79 um, back-to-back finals in uh, SM finals where we uh, unfortunately lost both finals. Um, you know, back then you played like a final four, you played everyone, and then you the best two teams played one another. It wasn't like today where you just play, you know, one semifinal, you get to the final you had to play everybody and the two best teams played. And by the time we got to the final, we were so short on players that, you know, we played William Copeland with, I mean, they were stacked, you know, they had, they had youth national team players up the wazoo. I mean, they were so stacked with, with Copeland at at the top. Um, By the time we got to the final, I remember both, both, both final fours, we went into undefeated and lost both finals. Um, So we just couldn't, we just couldn't hang the whole weekend with, three tough games and then play a final. Um, but, but, you know, we turned, we put Vestorulis on the basketball map. If it already wasn't there, we definitely, we definitely made an impression. Um, and my dad was, you know, the coach, the, the forefront of that, um, which it was an unbelievable time. You know, you, I talk, tell this to my three sons. I have three sons who are 14, 12 and five during those years, you know, grade six to nine, or six, maybe it's all the way up to high school. Like that's the period where you probably appreciate your sport the most. You probably like really enjoy it the most because you start to understand what it's about. You start flourishing a little physically, mentally, emotionally, socially, but there's also just so much joy. You just want to be in the gym all the time, you know? And then as you get older, it starts to become, okay, am I going to do this for real? Am I going to like really invest time? Is this something I want to turn into my profession or it becomes like expectations become serious? But during that period of like six to, you know, maybe first or second year high school, like that's just pure joy. Like you're, I mean, reflecting yourself, how many hours were you in the gym during those grades? If you ask yourself. Like, no, right you're now. right. You're right. Because I remember myself when I was in high school, I believe it was either my first or second year. So freshman or sophomore year in high school. But obviously the system is different over here. But, you know, I remember myself um, getting extra shots up in the gym and stuff like that, or even staying late. On Fridays, I remember I used to stay late and try to get extra shots up, get extra workouts in, lifts, whatever the case may be. And I would even go do other things off the court, you know, other workouts. Like I would try to go swimming sometimes um, just to get an edge of my uh, competition. Yeah, because you and because you loved it, right? I mean, there was just that joy. And uh, so that was an amazing time for me. Um, uh and then if, if I'm just going to my career, qu- kind of quickly the transition to that, um, my dad got a stroke my uh, when I was in the ninth grade. The plan was for me to just stay in Vesteros, go to school there. But then my dad got a stroke um, and we started looking for other options to, to, to go, you know, to move out of the country or to find somewhere. And it, it kind of happened very quickly. Um at that time, we had Sanda Yonosit, which was a, a uh, the national uh, our league. I ended up going there. I ended up going there. I had a great year. I was there for one year and and just felt like okay, I need a, I need another challenge. And then um, my second year in high school, I started my professional career. I moved to Sirte and played my rookie season with with an amazing team. And the idea was I was just going to kind of 
move there and work out with the, with the men's team and just practice with them. But uh, due to some injuries, um, due to me doing probably better than expected, um, I started playing a lot and got a lot of minutes, um, even started some games, um, had a lot of success and, and had an amazing rookie season, one rookie of the year, and just had great, great experiences with players like Patrick Stehman, Stacey Harris, you know, Mats Appel, Jukke Blum, Reda Brentebra, Ervin Musanovic, Sinis Apritic. Like, we just had an amazing stacked team. And uh, me being 17 years old, it was just like, wow, it opened up a whole new realm of like, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. This is, this is, this is it right here. And, um, you know, I'm, a funny little story. <laughs> so I, I finished my rookie, rookie season. Uh, on paper, I thought we were by far the best team in the league. We had a lot of injuries at the end of the season, unfortunately, a lot of key players that went down. And um, John Dickelman is the coach at the time. Um, un, un, unbelievable grateful for the opportunity he gave me. But I remember there was a the discussion, okay, well, we want to get better. We want to, we want to bring in someone who's going to, you know, shift, shift the needle a little bit. So they, they signed Ulle Håkansson, um, Håkansson's father. Um, and at the time he was a national team player guard, you know, one of the best point guards in the league, um, just a phenomenal basketball player. Me being 17 at the time who thought, and there was, you know, discussions that I was going to be the first Swedish player in the NBA. There was a lot of hype around me at the time. That hype had also got to my head where I remember thinking when they signed him being like, this is the dumbest decision you've ever made. You know, this is how, how can you guys bring in this guy when you got me, <laughs> you know? And, and uh, so I ended up, I ended up leaving and going to the States to, to finish my high school um, in the States. Uh, I, I played my senior year in, in LA, uh, but I remember leaving there and kind of like resentment, like, man, how could they do this to me? Like, and, and it's funny, like looking back now, like they brought in a national team guard I was 17 years old and I really thought that they were idiots. And let's also note that they, when they, <laughs> they brought him in, they also won the Swedish championship after me leaving. So, oh. <laughs> so know, all in all, it seemed like know, yeah, it was the right decision to, to make. But you know, it's, it's funny because I think, I think this kind of goes into like us as players. And, and I think that some of us might need that, like that mentality of like that arrogance of like, no, but I am better than everybody. But, but, to have that foresight and self-realization like no but this is you know because for them they're probably thinking like we bring in Ula we'll let Andrew play behind Ula for a couple years we'll let him develop in his own pace like it'll be great develop they can play together he can get stronger get better and within two years he'll be a, a, a national team guard for us you know but I didn't I didn't see it like that it was like you know I, I didn't have the hindsight of seeing you know that bigger picture and uh you know, if it's insecurity on my part or if it's just being naive, but that was around. Like, I remember leaving, like, just pissed off, like, nah, mess. I'm never messing with Sutterta again. Like, man, they can go screw themselves. And and um, I think this happens a lot to a lot of players. Uh, I know it definitely happened to me a lot in my career where I was just arrogant or insecure. And I I did not think of the bigger picture or the team. And I just kept thinking about my own career at all times, like, that what's the next job? What's the next profession? What am I doing? So I got really caught up in that. Um, because, you know, like I said, you know, let's not forget for me, uh, at Sud when I was at Sudertalia, I was ranked the top five player in Europe in my age group, you know, and, and they had be this summer before my uh, rookie season. So I'm going into my second year in high school. They had a, at that time, they had the Nike, uh, first year was a Nike Europe camp. They brought in, uh, they s select players from every country to partake in, you know, the best players, the best of the best. And then from that, they selected an international select team. So the first year it was only European players. And on that team, you know, you had players like Pau Gasol, Juan Carlos Navarro, Dirk Nowitzki. Um, and I was the captain of that team. Yeah, pretty good they're, player. They're decent. They're okay, <laughs> right? They're okay. <laughs> they, they went on to have decent careers. And I was a, 
I, I was the captain of that team. Um, so obviously wow. there was like a lot of hype of me going. I mean, like I was a, I was a pretty good 18 year old player. Uh, the second year they turned it into where the Nike camp became more international. They brought in players from Africa, from China, uh, from Japan. Um, so on that international select team, we had Yao Ming. Uh, now they had, they also had brought in Tony Parker. Um, Pau Gasol was also on that. Juan Carlos Navarro was on that. Antonio Futsis, who played in Greece for many years. Rebracha was, was an amazing player. Stacked. And Stacked again, so we, and we, traveled, we traveled the States and played a bunch of AU tournaments where we just completely destroyed teams, you know, played well. And again, I was a captain of that team. So, so my mindset was, you know, there is nothing other than the NBA. Like it was the NBA or complete bust. Like that was just at 18 years old. It was, um, so when they were going to bring in Ula, I'm thinking like, bro, who's this dude? Like, do you know, like I'm the captain of the international select, <laughs> you know? So it's like the arrogance was like, at yeah, all but you know what is high, interesting you know? that you mentioned that because <laughs> to me, I think it's two sides to that corner, right? Cause I feel like you want a player like that. That's confidence. It has confidence in himself and that wants to, um, you know, be that next guy or have that mindset of right. like, yeah, I'm next. But at the same time, just as you mentioned, you also want to have that balance where you could look at it as an opportunity to learn and get better from this yeah. behind a guy who at the time was better than you. For sure. But it was just that you had that arrogance and that confidence, that self-confidence in yourself, which is not necessarily wrong, like I said, because like I mentioned earlier, that's something that you want in a player. But it just sounds like in your case, it went a bit too far. But maybe you could have been like, you know what I mean? Hey, you know, I'm going to learn from this guy. I'm going to use this opportunity and use this going forward. It's going to help me develop even more going forward. But you know what, though? This is not anything new. It's not new. Like, we're not reinventing the wheel here. I mean, that's this still goes on today. I mean, you should see a lot of these younger players today that are jumping from team to team because they feel as though they're not getting the right opportunity, not the right amount of minutes that they're wishing for. And then what ends up happening is you get that label of being a guy that continues to jump from team to team and you get stuck in that mindset of thinking, hey, you know, the grass is always greener on the other side. And next thing you know, time goes by and you haven't really developed. You haven't really gone anywhere like you haven't reached that potential of what you hope to be. So at times you really have to yeah. look at the bigger and, you picture know, and try to see, one th- you know, where this could lead you. Right. And I think this forward. is a huge problem in our sport that there aren't enough, um, I'm going to say, unbiased, objective role models yeah. to help players yep, yep, in, you're their, right. in their, um, you know, their career pathway of helping them, guide them. I mean, um, and and this was something that I, I wish I would have had. You know, every person that was advising me was so was so subjective. I mean, my father was always telling me what to do, where to go. And obviously he always had me and my success uh, first at heart and, and never looking at like, okay, well, what's the bigger picture here? Um, I'll say that like with my profession where I work with now at the Federation as, as um, basketball development, that's something that we see all the time with players where, you know, they'll, they'll, <laughs> they'll only be thinking about their own performance or their own success. And, and I'm sure there's a lot of players listening right now. How many that can relate to this, how many times they've been on the bench watching their teammates perform, hoping that someone makes a mistake. So they get an opportunity to get into the game. Like they're hoping someone fails. So they get an opportunity. Not that they hope that they can be better. They're hoping that someone is worse than them. So they get the chance. And this was something that, that, you know, for me growing up, like playing, even during my professional career, how unhealthy the mindset is of an, of a professional athlete in team sports, because you're, you're playing at the highest of levels. You're playing at the highest of levels that, that you can possibly play at. And you're hoping that other people fail on your own team. So you get an opportunity. And we don't have enough people talking to our players about this, like, okay, well, what is the bigger picture? What are we trying to accomplish here as a team? What are you trying to accomplish? What are you trying to experience? 
I don't know how many times I've gone down on 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 after games and talked to players after a national team game. They've played in front of 10,000 people at Hobbit or Avicii Arena. And I'll say to them, and the first thing I say to them is like, man, thanks for that experience. Like that was so fun to watch you play out there. And their first, their first acknowledgement is, yeah, but I didn't do this. Yeah, but the coach didn't play me. Yeah, but instead of seeing like the bigger, like you just played in front of 10 thousand people you almost beat slovenia which has one of the best players in the world you just put on a performance and a show of a lifetime you always remember this game and you're so caught up in like this one specific shot or the lack of minutes that you didn't get instead of thinking how can we build on this and i and this is where i'm sad for our players in our sport in our country that we don't have enough people helping them on this or in this uh, that there aren't enough discussions. I know Oli talked about this in your podcast with him, that, you know, that's that support system for players. Like, who do we have around them, helping them? And not always just gassing them up or telling them they're the best, but also being honest and upfront with them. Be like, hey, okay, hey, we need to get you in shape. I know you can get in shape. I know, like, this is what I know you can get to. I know you can play at this level, but we, hey, man, we got to get our asses in the gym here. We got to, we got to put things, you know, we, what are our priorities here? Um, or on the team, like hoping for your teammates to do well, you know. Um, but but for you, like how how do you experience that? Like with with now and and Norship, you've been there a couple of years. Um, how is the how is how is that feeling like on the bench? Do you guys feel that you're that you guys are working for one another and and uh, rooting for one's success, success? Or do you recognize um, what I what I lifted here? I mean, I would say that in Norship, the culture is is different. Um, to be honest. And I mean, the proof is in the pudding. I mean, there's no secret as to why, you know, this club has been winning championships for the past three or four years, you know, even though I missed out on on one of the championships. But I feel like over here, everybody has each other's back. And that's everybody from player number one to player 15 who might not even begin reps in practice. And I think also if you take a look at the some of the guys that have been in before, you know, a lot of them tend to come back. And there's no secret to that. You know what I mean? Guys take yeah. care of each other. You know, guys look after each other on and off the court. You know, and, and I'll say this a lot, but, you know, especially to my f- friends and family, but the team that we had last year, you know, the chemistry we had with, obviously, Nick was here, Adam, and, and you know, the rest of the guys that we had here the, the year before, but also the imports that we had, you know, um, Devontae Green, Danny Green's little brother, James Murray Boyles, um, obviously, Marcus Tice, even though he signed back for another year. But with James and Tay, you know, obviously, you know, the chemistry that we had on that team, it ex- it exceeded basketball. You know, it wasn't just about basketball. Yeah. So quick story. Um, This is the day before game six, which was the game to to clinch the championship for us at home. And so, you know, the day before that, we had just came back from playing at Boros game five and we lost that game, which was tough for us, obviously, mentally, because, you know, we had hoped to clinch it on the road. So now we're feeling that pressure of, you know, hey, we got to win this one with this next one because, you know, this is it right. for us because we're definitely not trying to go back to Barros for, for game seven. So like I said, this is the day before the game. So Marcus um, and Maggie, the Tyus, is, you know, their daughter um, is having her, her birthday. So so the day before game six, we're at their apartment and we're celebrating the birthday of their daughter. Um, and I can't believe how old she turned if it was three, four or five. I think it might've been four, yeah. but um, yeah. yeah, we're all in there celebrating. And I'll tell you one through 12, like the whole team, the entire team is in there celebrating uh, her birthday. And we're in there shooting a the breeze, you know, giving out gifts, singing happy birthday, eating cupcakes with, you know, the faces on it. And, you know, just enjoying ourselves. And, and I remember sitting there thinking, wow, you know, looking around and kind of soaking in the moment because in my mind, I couldn't remember being on a team right. that were this close knit, that had this type of chemistry, like I said, that exceeded basketball. But it also carried over to the court because I felt, like I said earlier, we had each right. other's backs and we wanted each other to succeed, you know, on and off the court, whether it was here in North Shepherd or somewhere else. But with that being said, I've also been on teams that you're talking yeah. about where, you know, 
where co- the, mm-hmm. the story is the complete opposite, right? And, you For know, sure. guys might not begin along or, you know, the chemistry isn't right. And, you know, you might be sitting on a bench waiting for the next guy to get hurt or to mess up so that you could get your opportunity. It's a it's a very like thin thin line or or fine balance. It's it's hard, you know. And um, you know, I reflect a lot about my own career. Um, you know how, <clears throat> and I think I was good at you know. I, I felt like that I was always one of the captains of the team you know, where I was at, and, and I think that I benefit or contributed to a positive environment. But I definitely, in my mind, uh, was not always healthy in the aspect of like looking at a bigger picture or enjoying the moment. Cause I can, you know, when I, when I talk to players and they, they reflect on like, why well, I missed this shot or the coach didn't play me in a game in front of 10,000 people wearing your national Jersey and that they're not appreciating the moment. I can, I can relate to that. Like I was there at the same level and felt the same pain and felt the same anguish or uh, disgust or disappointment and it's not until, you know, my later years here that I've I've come to the appreciation like, hey, let's take a step back and enjoy this. Like, you know, this is this is a pretty big moment in your life. Let's try to appreciate this. And yeah, and I'm you know, I'm the biggest competitor there is. I'm not saying that we don't compete. Like I want to compete everything. You know, I want to be the best. I want this to be the best podcast you've had. Like I am the ultimate competitor. But I also feel and I hope that our players and coaches and fans and clubs can appreciate the moments that we're in, you know. I mean, like, there's there's so many people that aspire to be them, to look up to them. Like, they, they've, they've made impact on people's lives. Like, I'm paying money to go watch people perform to entertain me. Like, that in itself is a receipt that you've done very well in your life and career. Like, people are paying big money to watch you play or – paying you to play so i mean that in itself is something like that they should be proud of and i and i don't think that they're they're proud enough as often as they should be you know and and um i wish and hope that they take it in um as much as they can but at the same token too though it's tricky in this business because a lot of times those team accolades and team awards won't get you that next contract right you know, a lot of times it's all about the individual stats yeah. that'll get you that next deal. And so that's also what's messed up about this business. You know, that team success doesn't always carry that much weight. Speaking of which, you know, um, obviously, like I said earlier, you know, you're a close friend of the family and I've known you for, for a very long time. But I also happen to know that you're very close with Pierre Hampton and his family. And obviously, you know, I, I've known Pierre for a long time. We used to play against each other when we were kids, you know, probably since right. we were like 12 or 13 years old. And. I had him on a podcast a while back, and obviously I'm very impressed by, you know, the journey that he's made and, you know, some of the things that he has to had to overcome in his in his career. But I also know for you that it was a very proud moment f- um, to right. be able to see him put on a national team jersey last summer, I believe it was, when uh, they played against Germany at, at Horvath. So for you, tell us a bit about how it was um, to sit courtside and actually witness this from your perspective um, considering everything that he had to go through in his career and, you know, not only um, setbacks, you know, that he's had mentally, but also physically. Right. You know, I got an opportunity to play with Pierre when he was very young, when he was 18. That was at the end of my career. Um, uh, we played in Oda Brew together and um, you could see then the talent that the kid had. You know, obviously he was a, a young kid <laughs> running around reckless, you know, um, I, we had to kind of like pull in the reins a little bit on him because, you know, he was a young kid and, and uh, a lot of success and some of that success might have gotten to his head a little bit. But but he was also at that eight, that stage in life where he's trying to, you know, break free of of maybe of his family, of, of society as a whole and trying to find out who he is as a person. So, you know, at that time, um, I was 29. He was 18. I had just become a father. And I was also at the end of my career, I I felt that, you know, hey, here we have someone who's very special. Uh, I really want to invest time um, and and try to help this kid as much as I can and and try to take him under my wing uh, as much as I could and and be a support system for him during that time. And and during these years, we also have grown to become good friends, you know, not where it's not now he's under my wing. It's more that there's a mutual friendship and and mutual um, appreciation for one another 
so obviously like we're, the families are very close um you know and and i've followed his career for a long period of time and then obviously we've when he had the the situation with his health i remember like stepping into the hospital and and he looked bad man i mean i i have a video of it that is that his mom once sent me and and um when i tell you that that you wouldn't recognize him like it was scary to see him what he looked like and I remember we were sitting in the in the hospital room and he started talking about like, yeah, I don't know when I'll be able to play again. Like, we'll see. And I remember walking out and turning to my wife and, and just saying like, play again. Like, I don't understand how, I don't, I don't think he understands how, how close he is to death here. Like, this is just like, I'm hoping he survives. And he's talking about playing basketball. Like there's no way in hell, you know, fast forward. Then all of a sudden he gets the opportunity to play for our country. Like, you know, he gets called up to the highest of to the highest of opportunities to perform, play, participate for our national team. For our national team, there's no prouder moment for any player. I don't care what they say. Like career NBA, career Euroleague, to play for your country, to wear your national team jersey, to be selected among the 12 best players in your country. There's no there's no greater moment. Like if I look back at everything that I'm proud of, international select. California All-Star Game, McDonald's Reserve, you know, accolades. The the fondest moments for me were the times where I got to play for our national team and for our country and represent the country, okay? So to see him in that moment, you know, you used the word that I was proud. I was more impressed. I was more impressed to see the journey that he had made and he had gotten himself to that point where he earned it. He wasn't given it. He earned it. He deserved it. Like, he should have been there, and he's and he should be there. Like he is a phenomenal basketball player. You know, he's one of the best players we have in our league. That was an unbelievable, impressive journey. The hard work that it took, the dedication to put his body in a situation where it could excel. Um, so, I was definitely proud, but more impressed, and just happy for him, and happy for his family, and. I remember after the game, after the game, he was one of those players that kind of went into like, yeah, but, and I just told him like, Hey, <laughs> shut up. Like, what are you talking about? Man? What do you, what do you, let me, yeah, like, yeah, what are yeah. you talking about yeah. right now? Like you, you are, you are here. Yeah. Okay. We always want to play better. We always want to do more. That's tomorrow. Right now. Enjoy this moment. Enjoy this moment. Like yeah, you're back at the drawing board tomorrow. We're going to talk about what needs to get better what we need to get strengthened, what we need to improve, all our weaknesses, all our strengths. But right now, you are here. You are him. Like, this is it. Like, you got here, bro. Enjoy this. So that was a fun moment for his family. I was glad for them. I'm glad for him. Uh, that's a memory that he'll always carry with him. Um, and, you know, with that, I, I get surprised that so many players turn down the national team um, because I know for my own sake, like, now that my career is over, you know, those are the moments you remember the most. Um, there's, there's no greater opportunity. So why, why do you think that is? Why do you think players turn down the opportunity to represent the national team? Because you know, this has been a discussion that's been ongoing on social media over the last yeah. couple of months, especially just since the summer. I want to say, and I had the same conversation, the same discussion with Oli on the podcast not too long ago. So you know, to you, like, why do you think that is? Yeah, I think, I think for for. Yeah, I, I can't speak to specific players because I, I don't know exactly why. Uh, but I think if I generalize and make assumptions and I, I think about it from a player's perspective, and I turned down the Nash team many of times playing. There was a few tournaments that I turned down where I prioritized other stuff. So if I if I reflect on why I did it instead of talk about why they do it um, so I don't you know misspeak here. I think a lot of times we get caught up in like, the the what's the reward or the benefit of doing it let's what's the reward of me spending four weeks or three weeks or two weeks with them when i could be three weeks here with my personal trainer with my at home uh, comfortable in my house working out with my people um you know i think a lot of times they get caught up in like well what's how is it going to benefit me what am i going to be coming out of that and and i think that's why a lot of times people turn it down because maybe they need rest or they want to get in with their shooting coach or their strength and conditioning coach, or they just want to see their partner or they want to get home to their family. And that's, I'm, you know, I'm not faulting them at all for that, but I think that's a big reason is they maybe don't always see the bigger picture, the benefit of, of like the reward they'll get maybe afterwards after their career of like, man, I played 
with the national team this many a times. Um, I, I think it becomes they're so in the moment of like the next job, the next day that they they turn that down because they think something else is going to lead to a bigger opportunity. I really do think it's because of selfish reasons and don't see that they'll get a bigger benefit from it and, and a longer or bigger perspective. Um, that's that's the best answer I got and the best reason I think that it happens. Um, and it's unfortunate because, you know, because if you think of this, I don't think we've ever seen our Swedish national team and on the men's side, the women's side we have, but on the men's side um, with our best players. Like we always say, yeah, we've always said like, can you imagine if these players were here? Can you imagine if they were here? And um, so, so that's, that's been as a fan of basketball, um, I, I really wish that we can change that where people feel that pride and want to be part of it. And obviously like us as a federation, like we have to discuss with players, like, why are you not, why are you not participating? What are the reasons and finding out why, you know, how is it that a country like Germany can get all their players to play and we can't. So that's, that's something that we're always discussing, you know, in house, what, what can we do better? How can we improve? Um, but as a player, it's like it's it's also bigger of like that pride of wanting to partake in it. You know, it's it's uh, it's phenomenal when you get to look back on your career and and think about it because um, um, you know, to talk to your kids about it or talk to your friends about it, like those are unbelievable experiences. Especially now, like I'll tell you this: when I played, we weren't feeling Hobbit, we weren't feeling a Vicheriana. You know, we weren't we weren't bringing in these kind of crowds, and now we're doing on the regular. Like we. You know, it's like every game is like, okay, what gym can we fill now? Can we go even bigger? You know, can how big can we go? So it's, it's um, we're at a great we're at a great place right now when it comes to our national team games and events. Like our department for events, they do an amazing job with it. They sell tickets, they get people in the seats, and it seemed to always be a show. Like it's entertainment. Like I don't think many fans leave the games disappointed men's or women's games you know so it's been awesome to watch no for sure for sure but but let's touch on your career yeah. some more though because um okay. i overheard you saying that you uh was a reserve on the mcdonald's all-american team and <laughs> i feel like that's yeah a pretty big achievement so i want to <laughs> ask you so, who was on that team yeah, because you so just brushed was, it off like it was, was nothing and <laughs> obviously that's a pretty big achievement if you ask me yeah. So during that time, so this was um, my senior in high school. We we um, I moved to L.A. or, or Long Beach um, in L.A. and I lived with friends of the family. My family had stayed; they stayed in Sweden. I moved there uh, by myself. Went to high school, Los Alamitos High School, a public high school, which is mostly known as a football powerhouse, um, huge school you know, California dream situation, um, had a great year, um, played really well, but was, was often put in position where I was, you know, a, I mean, I was a big, I was a big guard. I was six, four strong and, uh, you know, high school basketball times, you know, you have a lot of small, small players. So at times I was put in positions where I was playing forward, and I never, you know, for me, I always had the ball in my hands. I was always the decision maker. Uh, I was very ball dominant. <clears throat> and so it, it took it. It was there was a bit of transitioning and process for me and the team to okay, where am I going to perform at best? Uh, but when I when it, when it started rolling, like it just everything went really well, and was selected to you know, I, I won all state, um, played in the California All Star Game with Gilbert Arenas, Tyson Chandler, Jason Capono, Casey Jacobson. Uh, played really well um, and was getting recruited by top schools. Um, at that time, I had I had uh, verbally committed to Davidson early on, and then there was some, I will say, problems with paperwork uh, where I was uh, I I didn't get accepted by the school. Uh, still to this day, I don't know what happened with all that, but. Then I was recruited by Utah when they had they had done really well. They had Andre Miller, uh, Rick Majerus's coach. They were a top school, top ten school. I was recruited by Rhode Island, who had Lamar Odom. Um, visited them. Ended up signing with Drake University, um, which was a top. 
I'd say top 35 school at the time, we were tough. Like uh, in Des Moines, Iowa, we were, we were tough in the Missouri Valley Conference. Um, but, but before that, yeah, I was also reserved. So, so what they do is they have, you know, they have honorable mentions and then they have like what they have is reserves and uh, they select the team. I never traveled to the game. I never was there, but had someone early on gotten sick, they would go through their list where I was on that list. I don't know. I don't know how close I was to actually making the game, but you get like this certificate first of McDonald's All-American honorable mention. And then I got like that, hey, you are on a short list of reserves if something was to come up. Um, so, and then I'll tell you this, at that time, I'm thinking like, why am I not on the, why am I not in the game? I'm better than half these dudes. You know, my mindset was. Yeah, so going back to who, who made the team? Because that's what I'm asking. I want to know who made the team. Oh uh, man, we'd have to we'd have to look at the list. I couldn't even tell. I know Jason Capono what was that year. So we'd have to look at I mean uh So so what year was this? This was 98-99. So you could we could do some quick research there and, and um Yeah, let me see what I could come up with real quick. I'm on hold on, give me a you second. Want to check. So I got Chris Lang, Dan Fife, Mike Miller, Frank Williams, Donald Curry, Jason Capel, Al Harrington, Danny Miller, Dan Street. You wait, you said it was ninety eight though, or it was a ninety nine? Nah, the year it'd be the next year. Oh, I was about to say because I didn't see Jason Capone on there. All right, let's see, ninety nine. You got Keith Bogans, Kenny Satterfield, um, Damian Wilkins, Casey Sanders, Jason Williams. Oh, uh, yeah, exactly. Carlos Keith Boozer. Bogans. Capono, Jason Capono. Yep, Brett Nelson. You had uh, Mike Dunleavy Jr., Nick Collison. All right, yeah, I see. Yeah, hey, you got some heavy hitters on there. Yeah, so if you look on the, if you look on the West team, because they do East and West, so it was like Boozer, Brett, Brett Nelson, who played in Sweden one year, Jason Capono. Right. So, and... Um, you know, and I felt, I felt that I was better than a few dudes on this squad. Obviously, I wasn't, but... In my mind, I was at that time. Um, but just to be, you know, just to be an honorable mention or, or um, you know, I played a lot against Jason Capono, a lot against uh, Casey Jacobson. Um, so, you know, Capono's from Lakewood, which is close to where, where I played. Gilbert Arenas should have been in that game. Gilbert Arenas was an absolute beast in high school. Yeah, I was he about to like say, because Gilbert's not on there either. I'm about to say, like, what the hell's wrong with this list? Dude, dude, dude shot like 65% from the floor and played in only running shoes. Dude never played – like that was his thing when he signed in Arizona. They made him like you have to play in basketball shoes because he was playing like in – he was playing – bro, he played the California All-Star game in Prestos and dropped like 35 on it. <laughs> like he was like just embarrassing people, dude. He was just – he was special. People you know? don't understand though. Gilbert, Ar- Gilbert Arenas was Steph before Steph. Like obviously, you know, Steph now is, you know, kind of taking all of those things to the next level and and – and he's Reggie Miller, Ray Allen, and, and Gilbert, all those guys combined into one player. But Gilbert was doing all those things. Like a young Gilbert was a killer. Like the things he was doing bro, agent, you know, when he was in the a, league. Agent zero, bro. You know, he was, he was, from, he was special, man. Like he, yeah. he was strong, athletic, could shoot. And, and, you know, for him, had he had some, I would say, better advisors, you could already tell them like the, the high school level, like we worked out and stuff like, Okay, like his talent was through the roof. Like he's just a special, he's just a special talent. Like, but his decision making off the court sometimes, you know, you could you could talk about. And I don't know if you follow him on social media, but even like some of the outlandish stuff he says, I follow him because I know him. But some of the outlandish stuff he says, I'm just like, whoa, bro, like this is this is too much. Like, and I and you know with this whole the gun situation that he had in the, in the NBA, you know, his career was cut short because of decision making off the court, you know, and I think a lot of like John Morant now, like what's his support system going to be to help him make sure with, cause guys like that, their talent is just like unheard of. Like it's, it's, it's unmatched. And uh, Gilbert, Gilbert was definitely one of those guys, because if you look at that, if you look at that, uh, that roster, both for the East and the West, like Jason, Jason Williams, who, who uh, went to Duke was, you know, had that motorcycle accident. He was, you know, he would have been a NBA hall of famer. But Gilbert Arenas was, I mean, he, I would say he was better than any of them. Um, so, 
if I def, if I thought I should have been on there, he definitely should have been on there. Um, but yeah, so so you know, but during that time, I, I became like friends with a lot of these guys where you would work out, and my summer workouts were just like phenomenal. Like, you know, going in going to L.A. You know, you go into L.A. and and sometimes we'd work out in Compton, sometimes we work out like in Long Beach, and I'm working out with like Tyson Chandler, Tayshawn Prince, guys that were like you know you know Jason Capono. Uh, Baron Davis, Gilbert Arenas, um, you know, and those were the guys that got me into the uh, UCLA uh, pickup games oh, later shit. on in my career. Yeah, the legendary and, UCLA pickup runs. Yeah, so when I would come home during the summer, we fast forward a little bit. Like when I was playing after I graduated uh, college, so I transferred from Drake to Lafayette halfway through my career, and and that that whole situation is a podcast in itself. Um, my whole college college experience because. Uh, my college experience wasn't the best. So I'll, I'll do this real quick for all those younger listeners that are thinking about college. And this is important to, to have with them going into it. My freshman year in high, uh, freshman year in college, I played really well. We had a Juco guard who led the country in assist. I was, I was backing him up. I was playing like 14, 15 minutes a game playing really well. Our coach was, was, uh, he, dude, he was, oof. Talk about talk about nightmares to play. Talk about nightmares to play for. He was one of those like, you know, he would. There was no holds bar when it came to, like what he'd say to you, the stuff he would say to you, and stuff like that. So, it was tough to play for him. But but I enjoyed the school. I liked the team. I thought I thought we were like in a good direction. Of, like I thought we could be like a top twenty five school. You know, my uh, <laughs> a little quick side note. My opening game. My opening game. And I wish we could find this on film. My opening game, we play against um, uh, Iowa State, and Iowa State has uh, Jamal Tinsley, who played at Indiana Ooh, Pacers for me. Yeah, and he was a and Jamal problem. Tinsley's, Jamal Tinsley's from from um, from New York, and a real New York guard, like a lot. He was really shifty, like he had these, like you know, he was just like shifty and everything he did. So I remember he's bringing the ball. We run like this two-two-one press. He brings the ball up. Th- uh, against the press, only going behind his back. Like he's just like dribbling up behind his back the whole way, just kind of like smiling at us. Ends up like me and him are matched up on the wing. And he does this, he has this spin move that I later like, I later adopted and like kind of like copied it myself because it was just like so special. He would like spin, but he would, you know, usually like when you spin, like you, your hips go first and the ball follows where he would like do like a one, two and on your outside, he would take the ball first around his back and then the body would follow with it. So the ball was like ahead of the body. Oh, oh so okay. he does, he does saying. that spin move on me. I'm like, Oh shit, I got to catch up. And then as he spins, he goes into like a stiff leg crossover. Oh shit. So, so in other words, he messed Bro, you up. <laughs> I, I kid you not. I kid you not. I kid you not, uh, I, like I'm trying to catch up and my whole body just fell to the floor. Like I just collapsed. Oh, shit. He, like, he, then he hits the crossover. He he knocks down the jump shot and I get subbed out as the ball goes through the net. That was like my – that game was on ESPN, bro. That was like my first game, my first game in college. Welcome to the big leagues. Oh, that was a TV game too. TV game. Oh shit! And you got fucked up on that national television. That was the only television. shot he made all game. <laughs> that was the only shot he made all game. But they just happened to be on me. But um, yeah, that was a little funny stuff. But so I was gonna tell you about. But my, he was nice though, because even when he played in the league, he was no, nice. He's so shifty, dude. Like you, man. He was the the ball was on a string. Like you couldn't stay in front of him. It was just like, mm. um. So I I played my freshman year. Have a decent year. I come back from my sophomore year and, and the coach is just like belligerent. Like it's just getting worse. Like he's just getting worse and worse. And I walk in, I'm like, Hey, I want to transfer. Like I want to get out of here. And he goes, well, how about you play the practice game? We had like, some, you have two practice games before the season starts. He goes, try this practice game. I think you're going to like really appreciate like the role you're going to have. I'm thinking about starting you and this other guard to, together the entire season. The, the Juco guard, who was really good. So I was like, all right, I'll give it a chance. He's like, and if you don't, if you don't, if you don't like it, then we can talk after the practice games. So I play the game. I score like 19 points. I miss the game winner. He comes in after the lock in the locker room after the game and just like reams me out. Like, yeah, you're wasteless. Like you're, you're pathetic. Like, why was I, what was I even thinking? Like, 
So I walk out. I'm like, I quit. I'm out. Like I'm out of here. I'm just out. Like done. I'm done with it. 19 years old, 20 years old. Like I'm, I'm, I'm getting out of here. Next day I walk in his office. Like, I'm like, Hey, obviously like I want to get out of here. You don't want me here. And he goes, well, that's unfortunate. He goes, that's unfortunate. I go, what do you mean? He goes, well, you know, the NCAA rules are if you play a, if you play a practice game, it counts as a year as eligibility. Oh no. He got you talking about. He goes, yeah. Yeah. He goes, yeah, you're screwed, bro. He goes, you're here. And I was like, he's like, I don't. And I, at that point, what the fuck? That's crazy. At that point, I, I was so like, yeah, at that point, mentally, I was just, I was so fed up. I was done with it. I was like, just get me out of here. I don't care what it's going to, if I lose a year, I lose a year. So I, I quit the team and I just start, you know, we start looking around for schools and, uh, it, it, I ended up transferring it at the semester and it was down, it was between Penn state uh, Lafayette, which, which because of my good friend, Kenny Grant, who had signed there um, and the coach Fran O'Hanlon, who played in Sweden, you know, probably the best player to ever play in Sweden. <laughs> um, he was coaching there. That seemed like a really good fit. Um, Penn state was really good at the time. I really wanted to go there, but, but there was more other factors going into it. And I just needed like a kind of a fresh start end up transferring there to Lafayette halfway through my sophomore year. So I have to sit out two semesters. Those are the rules. So I have to sit out sophomore year and first semester junior year. So I play half my junior year and then my entire senior year. We, we filed to get my, another year of eligibility, but don't get it. And this story, this story became a big story. There's a, there's a, a big author, uh, Feinstein, who writes for the Washington Post, who writes writes sports book. He wrote a big article of my case and 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 um, about this, like how how faulty the then NCAA was because of these. Rules. And this is back then. This is before. This is back then. Way back so then. So I played. So I played my freshman year. My freshman year, my half of my junior year, and and my senior. Year. So I got two and a half years of college basketball under my belt out of the four that you get. So if anyone ever wants to talk to me about like the benefit, you know, like what are the worst case scenarios, I could share some stories with them. So feel free to reach out to me and like, okay, what should I look for? What, what should I not, what should I not walk into? Because I loved my college experience as a person off the court, but as a basketball experience, you know, it was tough. Um, you know, it was, um, you know, it was it was challenging. It was hard. Um, I questioned a lot of things about basketball as a whole. Like, what am I doing with this? Uh, the fortunate thing was I got a great education out of it, which put well, you know, which set me up for the next stage of my life. So there's obviously a lot of benefits of of going to school, but you have to make sure the environment that you're choosing that you're going to be investing the next four years of your life in that they're the right. It's the right situation. You can't just walk in and say, yeah, well, they're going to be really good. How are the coaches? How are the teammates? How is the support system around them? How is the school? How is education? How is the degree? How is this degree going to set me up for the next stage of my life? You know, so, um, you know, so pers- on personal experience, like college, college was tough. Um, it was, it was challenging. Yeah, people don't, people don't understand, man. College is a grind, man. Like there are plenty of horror stories like what you're sharing right now where, the coaches might not be giving you the right opportunity that you want or be playing you those minutes that you want. Or even like in your case, like on a grander scale, it sounds like, you know, the coach manipulated you to stay and I mean, even completely lied to you and tricked you. Oh, bro. He was crazy. Dude, listen, this we, we play we play Southern Illinois. We get out rebounded by 18. We we had a charter flight flying back back to Des Moines. We fly back, we land at like three in the morning. We go in and drop our bags off. We start walking out. He's like, where are you guys going? We're like, what are you talking about? Like, we're headed home. He's like, no, nah, no, nah, we got we got practice. People are like, no, but we got we got to get some sleep. We got class at 8 in the morning. He goes, yeah, you'll get to class. Don't worry about class. But we're in the gym. Tape up. It's full tape. Everyone had to tape. Everyone had to tape their ankles, right? So we walk out. We come out. We come out on the court, and there's just four trash cans on each, one in each corner. And he's like, just start running. Well, like we run where he got just run till every man throws up three in the morning, bro. 18 years old. I'm thinking like, what, what did I just get myself into? Like, what is this? 
Like, is this, this is straight military. Like this is worse than inland military. Like, you know, I, I could go on and on for stories like that. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to discourage people, but you know, make sure when you, when you're making these decisions that you do your homework properly. And obviously like 2023, like things are better, you know, social media, internet, like, you know, we're at a better place than it comes to sports, but whatever it may be, whatever environment you get into, just make sure you know, and you talk to people around there that they can really share how it is because sometimes we get caught up in the hoopla and the, and the marketing and the opportunities and what's this going to lead to. And you know, you want to feel well, you want to feel good. You want to be in the right mindset when you're there and experience stuff, you know, how was your college experience though? Yeah, no, I was just going to say, it's funny you mentioned because, um, uh, I got into this um, lengthy conversation the other day with uh, some of my old college teammates uh, in our group chat that we have from back those back in those days, and you know we still keep in touch through the group chat sometimes, not as often, but it happens. And for some reason, we just started talking about our um, college experience, and we started talking about some of the st- stuff that we dealt with while we were in school. You know, some of the personal battles that we had while we were in college. You know, obviously, I went to a pretty small school in, in, in Jersey City, New Jersey, St. Peter's University. And um, my whole mindset when I picked a school was that I wanted to uh, go to a school that was close to home or close to family. Because obviously, I have family in New York. So that was my biggest deal breaker. That was uh, my biggest key um, going into my decision. And, you know, obviously, I didn't have that many offers. And, you know, this, is, this isn't that long ago. This is, you know, about... 10 years ago because yeah I understand too back then we didn't have we didn't have the same type of uh, same amount of players going to college as we do today I feel like today you know there's a bunch of players going to college like the pipeline has just exploded and also you gotta understand today we got all these you know exposure camps you have social media you have a bunch of ways that you could get looks or get offers that we just didn't have back then but anyways, I'm, I'm getting off track. But um, my, my college experience was honestly, it was it was hell. Um, it was probably the f- toughest time I've had playing the game of basketball. Mentally, I was um, kind of messed up. Um, I felt like I was put in a situation where I kind of had to learn to play basketball again because, you know, mm-hmm. the style of play, you know, over there in college basketball, especially on the East Coast compared to Europe is is completely different. Because you got to remember, too, you know, when I was going yeah. into college, coming into college, I was probably playing at three or the four at most. But my coach decided he wanted to turn me into a five. And so I never really found my footing um, coming into school. Socially, it was great. My classmates were great. My teammates were great. Um, like I said, I was probably like a 20 minute train ride into to New York City. So I got the chance to see you know, spend time with family, friends, cousins and all that. So that was great. So that was, you know, one of the most, probably the best, one of the better experiences yeah. that I've had. Um, mm-hmm. But basketball wise, it just wasn't what I had hoped for and what I thought it was going to be. And looking back, I probably should have tried to do what you did and um, and transfer after my freshman or sophomore year. But you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. So I guess everything happens for a reason. But for sure, looking back, I definitely should have considered and and looked at other options. And looked at the bigger picture before making my decision. But for me, too, I was kind of stuck in this catch-22 situation because, like I mentioned before, I didn't have that many offers. And I was, you know, 19 years old. I'm stuck in Sweden. I'm unemployed mm-hmm. because I'm out of high school at this point. And I had already taken a year off from from going to school. But, and so and so for me, it was like, OK, if I don't go to college, if I don't get admitted to college or don't get any any offers, and like, what are my other options? Like, should I get a job? Should I try to play professionally? Yeah. And I wasn't sure if that was something I wanted to do just yet, you know, because I had this dream in the back of my mind. I always had this dream of, of actually going to play college basketball. And so for me, it kind of felt like it was St. Peter's or nothing. You know what I mean? And so I kind of wish I had what you had. You know, I had the chance to go to official visits and stuff like that, but I never really had that opportunity. You know what I mean? I, you know, shit, I signed before I even went there, before I even seen the school. And once I signed, I was like, okay, well, shit, now I'm here. You know what I mean? Now I signed on for four years. And I got to see the school and see the campus yeah. after the fact, you know what I mean? After I signed. But hey, like I said, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. You know, definitely should have done some things differently. But um, I'm definitely thankful for... Um, some of the people that I met and some of the relationships that I have and that I've 
uh, you know, still cherish today. But yeah, you know, definitely should have things done some things differently. Yeah, I mean, it's it's like you said, it's it's uh, easy afterwards to look back and like, oh, I wish I'd have done this. You know, I mean, um, I, I wish I wouldn't have played the practice game. You know, I wish I wouldn't have gone to Drake. I mean, it's also it's also those moments or those situations that kind of define us and, and turn us into or challenge us to become those people that we want to be. So, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate for the the um, challenges that I've faced. Um, but I'm also very proud of the person that I turned out, you know, going through all of that, you know, taking myself through that fire. Mm-hmm.